go. Thanks for having me. Um, it's great to be here. I mean, I did a bit of my PhD at Harvard, and um, I always heard great things about Twitter. Although it's funny because um, when I'm giving a talk here, I'm not actually at Cambridge anymore. I'm at Columbia. Um, <laughs> So it's interesting turning events. Um, but that aside, I mean, uh, I, I am really enthusiastic to present Edward, which is a library for problem modeling. Um, and in this talk, I'll try to provide like an overview of what Edward is all about, and also um, give some of the details behind the design and implementation of such a library. Uh, this work cannot have been done without the help of my amazing collaborators and colleagues, uh, several from Columbia, Others for our external collaborators, like from Google, who have been helping on the TensorFlow infrastructure side of things, and also Matt Hoffman from Adobe. Also, please interrupt me, because I assume with this very small size audience, we can really get into technical details. Um, so first, I want to motivate uh, Edward through a set of applications. Um, so what I'm showing you here is topics extracted from 1.8 million articles from New York Times. Uh, this is from the SVI paper, where um, we've analyzed this massive corpus of documents, which cannot have been done with traditional inference algorithms at this scale. Um, and we've uncovered all this global information that's shared across many of these documents. So for example, in the first uh, topic, you, th you see things like game, season, team, coach, play, and then another topic, you see uh, politics, such as Bush campaign, Clinton Republican. I assume this was not this was done in like 2010 or so. Um, and in another application, we are trying to analyze populations through two billion genetic measurements. I believe this is from the Human uh, Genome Project, where essentially they just sequenced a ton of individuals, um, and we're trying to analyze ancestral populations that are arising through all these sequence of genomes. Um, and this is done also through a admixture model. The previous one was done to LDA. This is another various version of it. Uh, each of these colors represents a uh, ancestral population. Each of these vertical lines represents a individual. And you can see that for some of these individuals, they're very homogenous. For example, there's lots of just orange and brown. And other individuals, it's very heterogeneous. Um, you see a large collection of mixes between ancestors. Uh, and here's an example using STAN. This is probably the uh, most successful application of probabilistic mo uh, programming at scale. So here we're trying to analyze 1.7 million taxi trajectories in the city of Porto, where in this data set, um, you have a bunch of timestamps for each uh, taxi ride and you have a location for the start point and the end point of the taxi. And we're trying to analyze the general patterns that are covered, that are arising from this massive set of taxi trajectories. In this particular example, we're using a mixture model, uh, a dynamic type of mixture model. So we're um, trying to uncover the uh, most common sets of trajectories and patterns that are occurring through these sets of trajectories. And um, for example, you can see that uh, the blue trajectory is sort of going through the outskirts of Porto. In the middle is where the city center is. And that's captured through the green one, which you can't really see. Um, but in general, just using a very basic mixture model, you're uncovering this interesting phenomena. How does Porto use the analysis? Uh, it doesn't. This was, I think, some uh, data challenge uh, where uh, they were trying to form some sort of prediction by learning features from this data set and doing some logistic regression or something. Okay, so when you say it's a successful application at scale? Successful you application mean, as in... You mean in the sense that it was possible to turn it on? Yes, exactly. Yes. Like, you could not do this with uh, SMC in probabilistic programming. Um, even with ADVI, there are a lot of complications going on because um, some of the structure, because it uses many groups, uh, couldn't infer local invariables that are occurring in this graphical model at scale. And so we had to do some hacks uh, to get it working and so on. Okay, so we're interested in uh, thinking about how to enable these sorts of applications uh, through probabilistic programming. So I want to highlight three particular uh, questions that we want to try to address. Um, the first question is about frameworks. Uh, 
uh, namely what sort of principles should guide the design of such a software. The second uh, question is about the modeling language. How do we uh, not only build a class of models that incorporates things like probabilistic programs and stochastic recursion, but also expose structure in those probabilistic programs? Because in order to enable this analysis at very large scales, you need to incorporate things like graphical model structure, uh, conditional conjugacy, and all these other things. And finally, if I get to it, um, we're going to talk about uh, languages around inference where I'm very interested personally in uh, developing algorithms that work both statistically uh, and computationally in terms of their efficiency and how do we uh, easily develop algorithms that can extend to many different scenarios and encompass a variety of different methods, whether it be Monte Carlo, exact inference, or variational methods. Okay, so let's get started with the first. What principles should guide the design of a probabilistic programming language? Um, here I'm showing an example of one such organization. I've just taken a screenshot of Scikit-Learn's homepage. Um, this is an example, it's actually very successful for its purpose. Um, and what Scikit-Learn has decided to do is just organize all of the heterogeneous collection of machine learning techniques through classification, regression, clustering, and so on. And um, why is this sort of important? It's, it's important because if you're trying to organize things in this way, it directly impacts the set of abstractions you're going to build uh, downstream. Because in each of these topics, classification, regression, you're going to build a bunch of uh, models or classifiers or whatever uh, as subclasses in this algorithm. And if you use like learned before, you know, for example, that there is a specific class called SVM, there is a specific class called nearest neighbors, and so on. And is this the right set of organization uh, for doing the sets of problems and modeling that we're interested in? Um, so I'm gonna take a step back and introduce this uh, statistician. His name is George Box. Uh, he's known for many different things, particularly in the realm of experimental design. Uh, you might know him for his quip that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, it's really based on this iterative process for science, which he developed with some collaborators in the 60s and 70s. Uh, the iterative process goes as follows. You uh, have some scientific phenomena you wanna interest, you wanna analyze, you first, you're going to build a model for the science. You're going to posit all the assumptions you're going to make, uh, whether it be domain knowledge, particular theory in that science, or whatever. And given empirical measurements, given data, I'm going to infer a model given the data. So I'm going to collect, I'm going to incorporate both the information in the data and also the model. And finally, you're going to criticize how well that model fits using data whether it be the same data or held out data that you wouldn't use during the inference. Um, this allows you to analyze the different assumptions you've made when you posited that theory, and it allows you to possibly revise the assumptions you've made and iterate this process. So if you follow that cycle, this is what it looks like. This is uh, what Dave calls, this is what Dave Bly calls the boxes loop. Um, and it goes through doing modeling, inference, criticism, and then revising and going back to the modeling step. Um, you might know this for, from various uh, forms. For example, the separation of model and inference is one piece of this, but we're going beyond this to also thinking about how do we do criticism, things like um, uh, making more principled, uh, analyzing prediction accuracy, uh, posterior predictive checks, um, analyzing things like hypothesis tests, all those things go into criticism and it forms this uh, nice little loop. And uh, Edward in particular, uh, we've named it after George Box. Edward is his middle name, George E.P. Box. And uh, we're going to think about all these sets of abstractions that are used and necessary for creating this loop. Okay, and one Final thing in terms of frameworks, we are interested in doing these things practically. Practically, I'm, I'm being a little loose about that. Uh, so we're gonna use computational graphs, which is a very uh, useful tool, especially in the deep learning literature. Um, computational graphs, I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, are graphs where nodes represent operations and edges represent tensors communicated between operations. Formally, uh, I'm showing TensorFlow, which calls these computational graphs data flow graphs, and there's these like nuances between data flow graphs, computational graphs. 
Um, I'm going to talk about that. Um, in general, computational graphs are nice because they enable useful numerical tools. Uh, such tools include partial execution, namely if I'm going to uh, run a particular output of the graph, I don't want to do all of the graph at once. I can just do the particular nodes in this graph that's necessary to represent the final output. There's distributed execution because um, as you've written this thing down symbolically, you can determine which portions of it to send to particular workers or particular machines. And um, there's also immediately useful things like uh, symbolic auto diff, uh, which is very nice uh, for various reasons uh, compared to reverse mode auto diff or numerical sort of auto diff and many other things. Okay, so uh, with those frameworks in mind, I'm just going to show a very uh, brief and complete example where it's a very toy example. You're trying to model point flips and this is the interface that we've somewhat finalized uh, and we as in the group of collaborators I showed. Um, so here's, here's how it goes. Um, there are four components, just like boxes loop. First you start with data. I have a sequence of binary outcomes, zeros and ones. I'm going to posit a model uh, that models these coin flips where zero is either heads or tails, depending on what you uh, define it as. And I'm gonna define this beta Bernoulli model. This beta Bernoulli model has a latent probability P, which is shared across all of the data points or outcomes. And I'm going to define this uh, Bernoulli distribution. It's 10 dimensional, 10 for each, 10 where each uh, element in this Bernoulli random variable represents an outcome in the data. And I'm sharing P across the, um, across the data points by just creating this vector of ones and multiplying P by it. Uh, now during inference, this is a very explicit form of doing inference. I'm first defining these tensorflow variables. These are trainable parameters that can change in the computational graph. I've defined them initialized by standard normals. That's what tf.randomnormal means. I've initialized them using these standard normals and I'm taking a soft plus transformation of these tensorflow variables. What soft plus does is just take a unconstrained uh, space and map it to a positive space. Uh, and this is particularly useful because if I'm going to do variational inference on this thing, where the variational distribution is a beta distribution and its parameters are uh, A and B in this case, they have to be positive. So I'm doing the soft plus to unconstrain the parameters and now I'm going to do a form of inference. Here it's mean field variational inference. It's a trivial model where it's only one dimensional so it doesn't really matter if it's mean field or not. Uh, how the interface to inference works is that I'm going to bind the latent variables in the model, P, to QP. Um, formally, what I've done is I've defined this model graph, this graphical model P and X. I've defined this other graph, which is QP, and I have to now match the latent variables in the variational graph to the model graph. So it's P to QP. And finally, I'm going to bind all of the uh, random variables that we're conditioning on. So here it's x to its real set of realizations, x underscore data. And then I'm gonna run this thing for five iterations. Uh, for criticism, I'm going to create this posterior predictive distribution. What I'm doing here is um, this thing under the hood called copy, which allows you to change pieces of the graph. So I'm copying x and changing its connection from p to qp. So it's the variational distribution connected to the likelihood, that's just the procedure predictive, and now I'm going to do a PPC on this by checking the means. Is an iteration here a step of your mean field optimization? Right. Um, any other questions? This is really a very brief thing, you don't have to understand all of it, it's, it's sort of an overview of what the syntax kind of looks like. Um, and the, you know there are very many extensions of this. For example, if your data is not fit in memory, um, where you know you can't collect everything as a, a NumPy array, TensorFlow has all of these data readers where you only need to collect a mini batch of it at a time, and we deal with ways to do the data subsampling. Um, basically, you have to define a, a subgraph of the graphical model, and you work with that subgraph rather than storing the entire large model under the hood. Okay. 
so let's go to the second point. Um, how do we expose structure and problems of programs? And we're going to use this framework to, to sort of get there. Um, why is, first, let's answer the, ask the question, why is structure important? So I'm showing you the first application uh, with the 1.8 million articles from the New York Times. And I'm gonna ask the question, what existing privacy programming languages enable that analysis? Um, this is just LDA on 1.8 million articles. And you know, it's a very basic model and um, you should expect uh, algorithms to, to efficiently solve this. Um, so here are some examples. Uh, there's Church, Venture, and Anglican. They very much focus on SMC and these lightweight sort of metropolis Hastings algorithms. Um, that won't work on 1.8 million articles. Um, there are various reasons for this. The technical reason is that if you're working with this product over a very high dimensional density. Um, Stan sort of can do this. It has ADBI, which is a automated form of variational inference but it can't really work with um, hierarchical models with many groups. In, LDA, in the LDA's case, it, it can't work with um, graphical models with a very large collection of documents where there are many latent variables per document. Um, and there's things like white people from uh, Noah Goodman's group and there's IMC3. These things also have a form of ADBI and you can kind of do this with LDA. Um, the way you do this is using inference networks where you can globally parameterize the variational factors so you don't have to deal with a very large uh, variational distribution, but it still doesn't really work that efficiently. And finally, there's something like infer.net, which is perhaps the optimal thing to do for small data, where variational message passing is um, sort of a very good algorithm for leveraging all the conjugacy that occurs in an LDA, but still, um, the graph structure is not alone. You have to use that um, in conjunction with a form of data subsampling uh, that was introduced in an SVI. So all these languages are sort of getting there, but they're not quite, um, they're not quite there yet. Sorry, I, didn't quite, I don't quite understand yeah. the difference between what you're doing and uh, stochastic variational inference with automatic differentiation. Yeah, so imagine, for example, that you want to leverage the conditional conjugacy that's available in SVI. So you know in particular that a uh, Markov linkage or a particular node in the graphical model has this uh, conditionally conjugate structure. You want to leverage that analysis, or you, lever you want to leverage that information in order to efficiently perform uh, inference. Right. And, th and these things can't be done uh, in something like Stan because the first thing that's immediate is that Stan only works on uh, continuous latent variables, and so you have to collapse those things out. But then on the collapse LDA case, uh, you run into lots of problems with um, with running to these these local optima and so on. So do you automatically collapse things out, or like, sorry, I, I guess I don't quite In understand. Stan, or? No, I mean, so I, I don't understand the difference between those issues and what you're doing. Yeah, so. Um, and the example you showed was like collapsing things out, right? Sure. It's like a super simple thing that any of these could have done also, right? So sure. what's the, or like any of the ADDI things would, would look almost exactly the same. Right. So what's the, so I guess I don't quite see what, what the difference is between, I mean, maybe, maybe this is sure. a point, yeah, but, no, sure. but uh, yeah. Sure, so, um, can I run Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah then. Okay. Also, if I'm just jumping the gun on the question, no, 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 no. please, like. Um, so let's start with an even simpler model then. Um, this will showcase the problem. Yeah, or, or LDA is, is fine if like the point is gonna be that you don't have to collapse things out. Yeah, I mean, collapsing is not the issue. Okay, so I have, let's run this. Okay, so I have a global latent variable P, I have local variables alpha K, and I have XK, uh, there are K many data points. So I have this distribution, P of phi, product P of alpha K. Let's connect this one as well. P of XK given alpha K. Okay, so now imagine that you have a million data points. So what is the dimension of the latent variables? There is a million of these guys. And there is, say, 10 of these guys. 
So now you have a million ten uh, latent variables, and if you want to do something like ADVI, well, you're just collecting all these things as, say, theta, alpha, k, b, and you're going to update all one million ten latent variables at once. Okay, sorry, but that's just the difference between stochastic VI or like mini batches for that optimization and not, right? Um, I mean, no. I mean, so, so if you do mini batches yeah. for stochastic VI, right, then you don't need all the you don't need all the latent variables ah, for your entire but, data. but that's the thing. So without that local um, latent variable structure, um, what you're going to be doing is updating all these, but most of these are going to be zeros, and you're actually going to compute those zeros as you do the updates. So you, you, mean, be able to not, you mean, just mean it's not these systems aren't smart enough. To know that they don't need to make updates for things that aren't for latent variables that aren't in the mini batch. Yeah, without that structure, you can't tell where or not whether or not to throw them away or not. Okay, so okay, so it, it's not aware that mini batches might contain latent variables in addition to observed variables. That's correct. Okay. So that's the delta between what you're talking about and and like Stan. Yes. Okay. Um, it's like more intelligent mini batches. Basically. Okay. It's all about the, the graph structure and something with inferred on that, like you could implement that, but they just haven't really done it. Okay, so um, let's start with the uh, basic building block uh, for models. Uh, and we're gonna go into our version to enable that sort of analysis. So we're gonna define this random variable. It's formally gonna be an object, which is parameterized by tensors in the computational graph. Here are some examples. I have a univariate Gaussian standard normal. It's parameterized by zero and one. I can also define a two by three matrix of exponential families, sorry, exponentials. This is just a two by three matrix of ones that's going to form the lambda parameter of an exponential distribution. And you can also deal with multivariates. In this particular case, I'm just defining a single k-dimensional Dirichlet distribution. Uh, each of these objects is equipped with methods such as log prob and sample, mean, variance, whatever. So uh, that's very basic. Now, how do we start leveraging graph structure? So what we're going to do is wrap uh, particular tensors in each of these random variable objects. X, I'm gonna have to denote this thing called X star. X star is a sample from that random variable. So if I've defined P of X given theta star, uh, attached to it is the sample based tensor X star, and that's what that graph denotes. Um, and what's particularly nice about wrapping this tensor is that you can now do ops on the computational graph based on this tensor. So if I wanted to do something like define X to be this 10 dimensional normal random variable, I'm going to define Y as a tensor flow constant, which is 5. Now I can do operations such as X plus Y, X minus Y, X times Y, and so on. And what these, these, what these things do under the hood is operate directly on that sample tensor. Um, and if you run the graph for x star plus y, you're going to get a sample from x, and then you're going to add that sample to y. Um, and you can also do things like apply various nonlinearities because these are just deterministic operations on the sample. So I'm doing a tan h of x times y. I can also do indexing where I'm taking the third normal random variable in this vector of random variables. Okay, so now let's get into some interesting portions of it. So direct to graphical models. How do we incorporate the graphical model structure? Um, let's take this example, it's just the beta Bernoulli that I've shown before. Uh, P drawn from beta 1, 1, uh, each data point drawn from Bernoulli P. So to form a directed edge between these random variables, P to X, I'm going to input p into x as like simply as put, and what you're going to do, what's going to be happening under the hood is that it parameterizes x not by p but by p star its sample, um, and that's going to form the Bernoulli of x given the sample from p. Uh, so that's what these two lines of code denotes. P is defined as that beta uh, 1.0 1.0, and x is defined as uh, a vector of p's n-dimensional length. So that's why that's how you get the sharing across data points. You just broadcast p across the n vectors. Um, so what does that do under the hood? It defines this computational graph. So p is uh, attached to p star. X is uh, conditionally dependent on p star at the sample tensor, and x star is drawn from x because x contains x star. 
Now, what can you do with this thing? Uh, running the graph for x, uh, it will first generate the probability p star from the beta distribution, then it will generate data x star from this vector of interleaves. Uh, and now what's nice is that this directed structure is exposed in the computational graph because you know just by looking at the graph that x is connected to p and so on. And you can tell for a particular tensor what its class object that it's containing um, is. Um, and now you can sort of write model specific algorithms rather than just generic ones because you know in particular that this is a beta prior connected to a Bernoulli distribution, so you can actually uh, incorporate conjugacy um, and determine, for example, that the posterior distribution for this thing is another beta. Okay, so let's go into a little more complicated example. So here I'm showing a variational autoencoder for a binarized MNIST data set. The binarized MNIST data set is just a uh, collection of 28 by 28 pixel images. Each value uh, for a pixel is 0 or 1. I am defining this standard normal prior, a d-dimensional standard normal prior. Uh, then I'm going to apply a neural network to the prior random variable, Zn, uh, and that's going to parameterize the Bernoulli distribution uh, for the data. So d is the latent dimension, the xn is a 28 by 28 uh, pixel image. And this is the generative process for the probabilistic decoder in a VAE. Okay, now how am I going to define the encoder? I'm going to apply an inference network. It's going to take as input xn, the same xn as before. I'm going to take a neural network parameterized by phi, and it's going to output parameters of a normal distribution. Okay, is that clear so far? So here's the syntax uh, using TensorFlow and these very simple random variables. First, it defines z as a n by d normal distribution. It's the vector of normals. Then I'm going to define a hidden layer. Here I'm using Keras just because it's a TensorFlow library and you can. So I'm defining a 64, uh, a layer of 64 hidden units with a real u nonlinearity. It's applied to z. Then I'm applying another uh, hidden layer. This one is 20 by 28, just the matrix multiplication, and it's going to parameterize the logits of a Bernoulli. We're using logits just because um, it's more numerically stable than defining the probability that, uh, constraint from 0 to 1. But you can map from logits to the constraint point if you like. Uh, that's the probabilistic decoder. And then for the encoder, you do a very similar thing. Uh, but uh, for generality purposes, you might want to change the input to the inference network. What we're defining here is a TensorFlow placeholder. Uh, I think in Theano, it's like a shared variable. Uh, these things allow you to change that input during runtime. So it's just a value in the computational graph that can change. So this is n by 28 times 28. In other words, the entire data set of MNIST. Um, and I'm applying another uh, hidden uh, hidden layer. This is the same uh, architecture as before, so it's hidden uh, with 64 hidden units that I'm defining um, the output or of parameters to this normal distribution, which is just a dense for uh, mu and then a dense with soft plus transformation to get sigma. So each of these uh, two models or uh, pieces of a variational autocoder are just written in three lines or so. Uh, and just to complete this example in the entire script, uh, I've put at the top the number of data points, n, which is 1,000, the number of latent dimensions, which is d, which is 10, and at the end of this, I've loaded in this text file, x.txt. You can also just imagine that you're drawing the data from TensorFlow's utility functions for MNIST. Then I'm defining data by binding x, the observed variable, to x underscore data. Note that these dimensions do have to match. So if x underscore data is uh, n is a matrix of 1,000 data points and 20 times 28 columns, then x has to be a graphical model, has to be a distribution of n times 28. It has to be a matrix like that. 
And then obviously I'm going to bind the placeholder to the same uh, value. X underscore pH is binded to X underscore data. And so this is smart enough to automatically know to partition X pH? Uh, there is no partitioning. Because that's the example like that you were saying is what differentiates this from. Well, yeah, so all this. That it would do it, it would realize that that the that you, that XPH should be part of the mini batch. All of this right now oh. is on the full data set, so there's no mini batch. Okay, so it's learning all of this. Right? Yeah, it's learning all of all this. It assumes that all this fits in memory and so on. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, you can do more things besides just directed graphical models. You can also do undirected models. How do we do this? Um, we just represent undirected edges through directed edges. So I'm taking an undirected graphical model of x and y, and converting it to x goes to y and y goes to x. And then later during inference, I'm going to tie both x's uh, together. So in code, this is defining this node in the graph. It can be anything, but we're going, so here it's just a tensorflow constant of zero. That's x underscore tied y is dependent on x underscore tied, and then x is dependent on y. Does that make sense? It's just a very uh, trivial representation of an undirected graphical model. But they could have different parameters, right? Which ones? I mean, so the sigma, like, so you set the sig both sigmas to be one, but, yeah. but they kind of need to be the same parameters for that to be one edge, right? Because you're basically saying you're, you're treating two Closing directed edges as one undirected edge, right? Yep. So, the, but the parameters aren't coupled, or like, well, I guess you'll explain how those are learned later, right? Yes. Um, do you mean how x underscore tied and x are? Yeah. So that's varied, like somewhere. Yes. Sure. And then I need to learn sigma. No, in this particular case, we're not learning sigma. We're just fixing sigma as one. I see. Okay. Yeah. So, the so, gonna, so that's going to be like a prior offset. Yeah, we're we're assuming these are known uh, standard deviations. So what is that? What distribution does that create? I don't think this is uh, this distribution exists. It's just like okay. a example. Yeah. Okay. And if the sigmas weren't tied, yeah, then it would not be an undirected edge. It would be a loop. Sigmas don't have to be tied in this case. I mean, I just defined one because there. It can also be, a, for example, standard deviation for y could be. 20 and standard deviation for x could be 6. But like a really simple example, like if, yeah. if this was just a, like a binary icing model, yeah. and I said, here's the weight I want to have in my undirected edge, how would I write it in this, in this way? Uh, weights between edges, we're not sure about yet. Yeah. This particular uh, scenario happens with conditionally specified models where you're dealing with directed cyclic graphs, and this uh, syntax is, is very easy to do that. So is it correct to say that like, so you don't know what distribution this is, you're doing the thing where you just basically define it in terms of conditionals and hope for the best? Yeah. Okay. But there's no guarantee it even corresponds to a real distribution. Yes, for example, with um, this recent paper on exponential family embeddings, which tries to generalize word embeddings to a probabilistic model, uh, they define these conditionally specified models which don't actually have a valid joint, but you can still do things like pseudo likelihoods on them. And to get like reasonable or interpretable answers. Because you can cook up kind of like pathological examples for binary variables, and one guy wants to be the same as one guy wants to be the same, and the other guy wants to be the opposite, right? right. And then they would they wouldn't correspond to a real distribution. Right. Once you start like moving away from the, the that diagram, then things get a little fuzzy. Uh, and then finally, um, you can do things like uh, Bayesian correction models. Uh, you can do stochastic control flow. How this works in a computational graph is that there are these control flow ops, and you just operate on them. Um, if you're familiar with dynamic RNNs, uh, where the sequence of uh, inputs is unknown, then uh, it's very analogous to that. And you just use this thing called a uh, TensorFlow while loop. And it just collapses all of that uh, uh, lazy evaluation into a single node in the graph. So the, the while loop, so this is assuming that there's some kind of like exchangeable process for generating the parameters? Is that what the while loop is doing? Yeah. Okay, like a CRP or something like that? Yes, exactly. So for like a Dirichlet process, it's very simple because you just use a stick breaking construction. Um, but like there, a Gaussian process, a while loop wouldn't do the trick. For a Gaussian process, um, how we've been doing it in applications is by marginalizing it out. 
and just working on the uh, RAM matrix. Um, are there other cases where you'd actually work on the function space? Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's all I have for the, the model structure. Uh, one particular thing that's uh, useful to keep in mind is that we haven't represented plates at all. We've done everything in terms of a vectorized operation. So if you look at something like um, this beta Bernoulli, we haven't actually said that uh, xn is connecting this plate of size n. And this does come up in this hierarchical model, for example, because if we define a uh, 10 dimensional vector phi, a k dimensional vector alpha, and then connect that k dimensional vector to x, then there's no local structure that's attained just in defining that computational graph. What you really have to do is give this sort of information during inference. Uh, and so that's one caveat that we've sort of had to deal with in computational graphs. So you mentioned uh, exploiting conditional conjugacy. So you basically treat that as like a, a compile time optimization where you, you like look for graphs, subgraph structure that's recognizable as, we, as like here's a beta Bernoulli, here's like a normal inverse Wishart, like this kind of thing. We've thought about um, what to, uh, sort of automates the conditional conjugacy, right now we're doing it manually because um, there are various reasons why you might want to keep the thing uh, unclapsed. I, I see, so so it's not that it automatically handles it, it's that like it gives you tools. It gives you tools to, yes. to do it if you'd like. So, okay, so that, that must relate then to the flexibility of inference time that you, yeah. can, you can say, here's the way I'd like to do inference of these variables. Yes, yeah, so what's particularly nice about um, having all the sorts of structure is that now you can do the model specific algorithm that leverages that conditional conjugacy, like a vanilla SVI algorithm you can now do um, with things like um, variational message passing you can do as well. How much time do I have left? Um, say 10, 20 minutes. We're okay. kind of flexible. Um, I can briefly go over this. Um, Okay, so um, now to talk about a little bit about inference, um, we really want to build infrastructure to support a variety of algorithms, uh, whether it be the conditionally conjugate algorithms uh, or exact inference where you can just do discrete summation, collapsing out something like a multinomial distribution in a mixture. Um, that's something you might want to do. It's a very trivial form of exact inference, but it's possible. Uh, then there's just a variety of MCMC tools that we'd like to encompass. So how do we build infrastructure to support all of these sorts of algorithms, and how do we do them efficiently to make it easy to extend various algorithms? So what we do is just use class inheritance, where first we define the space class in, uh, inference. It has a bunch of uh, primitive methods, and there are a bunch of different algorithms which inherit from uh, other classes. So I have this variational inference class, it inherits from base class inference, I have an exact inference class, it also inherits from inference. And there are subclasses that then are uh, inheriting the primitives to variational inference. For example, in the variational inference class, we have a bunch of default optimization routines. Uh, we use, for example, Atom as the default learning rates. Uh, we have forms of uh, uh, data to sampling as a default. Uh, if you don't want to work with TensorFlow placeholders and so on. Uh, and then something like KLQP and KLPQ, all they do under the hood is define a loss function. And then variational inference uses all of its default methods to minimize that loss function. Um, in particular scenarios like uh, KLQP, we um, sort of automate the uh, amount of model structure you have. For example, if you only have uh, gradient of the model's joint density, we use the reparentization gradient, assuming you can do the reportation, otherwise we default to the score function gradient, and stuff like that. Um, if you do have a conditional conjugate structure, then you can do SVI. And one thing that's nice about the uh, graphical model structure is that you can sort of compose all these algorithms as you will, where with an interface, let's see if I have it, with an interface like this, you are choosing a dictionary of latent variables to infer, and you don't have to infer the entire graphical model once. You can imagine doing um, 
inference over one set of latent variables using a particular class and then another set of latent variables for another class. And then you can do the updates uh, for each of these things uh, iteratively. So if I wanted to do like, like vanilla EM, then I could call then I could call VI on the set of latent variables and then call map on, on the like global variables? Yeah, so I'm, I think I have that commented in, let's see. Or if I want to do like like Monte Carlo VM, I could I could replace that VI step with with like an MCMC sampler. Yeah, so we think of um, uh, EM as as doing precisely map and uh, and yeah and some conjugate structure in vanilla EM, and then for Monte Carlo EM, you do leverage a Monte Carlo algorithm. And so then something like EP, so that winds up being iteratively applying the KLPQ to different subsets of variables? Uh, yes, that would be it. Um, and it's nice to have defined all these uh, algorithms where you can pass in various latent variables because it really takes a philosophy of like message passing um, because you're doing these things locally. In this particular case, uh, with the EM algorithm, I'm defining uh, let's start with the model. The model is very simple. Like that. I have a global uh, random variable beta. I have local random variable zn. Should and I have to be on this on inference m. Oh, uh, you mean the uh, conditions? Yeah, so the first line, the top line, I mean, so inference E makes sense, right? Because yep. you're basically doing inference over Z given some data that you're seeing mm -hmm. and presumably conditioning on the, how, like, how do you tell it which which versions of, of the beta that you're using? Oh, so. Um, Does it just have this, like, latent state that you're mutating when you call map? Yes, that's that's the point of the um, these TensorFlow variables. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, taking a step back, before we get to the compositions and inference hybrids, um, let me show you the interface um, once again. So the inputs to all these algorithms are just uh, the set of latent rows you want to infer. We're taking a variational inference perspective where you're always uh, positing an approximating family. That, that is binding uh, the variational factor to the latent variable. Uh, because in general, when you're working with computational graphs, you need a set of nodes that represents the posterior. So that's what uh, QB and QZ are. Uh, and to do something like MCMC, what we do, or what we interpret it as, is defining a empirical distribution where it is n by t dimensional, where t is the number of uh, time steps and we're storing all that information within the graph itself. Okay, so Q beta, sorry, so Q beta becomes, becomes basically like a just like empirical collection of, of, of samples mm -hmm. that you're treating as a variational approximation. So you're saying run MCMC to, to create a variational approximation that in this case is a bunch of samples and then, and then you can, and then the idea is that gives you an interface to do the other, to the other updates. Would that like include the for loop something, or multiple, or that's just supposed to be one it's, uh, step of the operator? The It depends on how the inference algorithm updates parameters to these uh, nodes. Okay. I've um, simplified some of this, so Q beta is something like this, where it takes as input parameters and defining a tensorflow variable or let's say it is initialized with a matrix of zeros. These zeros are n by t dimensional. One, two, three, that's three, right? Yeah, anyways, so these are the set of parameters that go into an empirical distribution. And what MCMC does is that it updates, say, the first column and the first update and the second update is it updates n2. Does that make sense? So we're interpreting MCMC as 
having this very large empirical random variable and it's only updating one of these out uh, at sequence. Uh, and why we have to do something like define this empirical random variable is to do that sort of composition that Ryan was talking about. Wait, so you want, you want Carl inference to do the empiricals. So as a kind of like an MCMC guy, it seems yeah. like that sweeps a lot of a lot under the rug. Is it like in terms of like what MCMC operator you're going to use and like what the what the sort of parameters are of that? Is that just because it's an abstraction, or like does it let me get into the details of how I'd like that MCMC algorithm to run? The transition operators, um, how that is played is going into the MCMC itself. So if you look at this particular um, composition of algorithms, there are things like Metropolis, Hastings, Gibbs, uh, Particle Gibbs, SMC, and so on. Uh, each of these is still working with an empirical random variable, it just with different ways of updating parameters to that empirical random variable. Yeah. I, and I, I think that's that. I general that. I guess I just mean like if I wanted to like, um, I'm, I'm assuming when you write MCMC, that yep. that's, that's random walk on top of the state because it's like what it's doing. Yep. But the uh, but if I wanted to replace that with slice sampling or something or HMC, yep. um, is that is that are these other operators defined or are they things that I could easily write myself? Or you know, well, I guess what's the interface for writing a new a new like a new inference algorithm? Uh, I'm not sure if I have slides for that, but I can show you just code. Sure. Oh yeah, that's true. I can show you through this then. Oh, I don't have the MCMC checked out. Um, I can show you another form of update. Let's see if I have it. Like, it, like, yeah, like in the LDA example, like if I wanted to take advantage of conjugacy and make like, you know, do Gibbs updates on that, given some structure or like some fancy new model I come up with, um, is it essentially a kind of like a, like update yourself type of, I mean, I don't know. It, um, would you have to define explicitly like, a class for oh. that specific type oh, of model. Oh, I see. But right, I see what you're saying. So, yeah. in this particular distribution, you can access these parameters. Let's assume that this is called var, and you can do something like assign this thing a particular value. And that's exactly how we do that in CMC. We assign the first column the update, or the accept or rejection sample. Uh, from the Metropolis Hastings. Does that answer the question? I don't think so. I guess I'm imagining that, like, like imagine that I wanted to, like, give you a bunch of pull, you know, I want to issue a bunch of pull requests that add sure. fancy algorithms. Like, I do research on MCMC, right? And so a really obvious thing for me to do is to, is to try to plug those into uh, probabilistic programming frameworks. And the, uh, um, in general, though, that like things like Church and Anglican don't let you do that because they don't have any like abstractions for that. But part of what you're arguing here is that you're you're adding abstractions for inference algorithms. Yep. So my question is essentially like if I come up with like a fancy new fancy new procedure for like a awesome new MCMC operator, I'm I'm curious like how that how you gen how you make that generic. Ah, okay. I understand now. So, uh, what was it called? In this base class that the MCMC algorithm inherits from, there are the um, there are things that deal with uh, that structure of latent variables z to qz and beta, x to times four beta, and then if you want to find a custom algorithm, say let's do class uh, custom MCMC. Okay, I'm going to inherit from Monte Carlo. Uh, now, of course, you have to do that some that init stuff. Ignore that for now. Uh, and the only method that you have to 
uh, write down is this update. And within this update method, you do this assigning. And, and I get access to a conditional like uh, log density? Yes. If, you, if you'd like to uh, have access to the full joint density, you can do that. You can also get access to just the lightweight portion or the uh, sum of prior log density you can still have. Okay. And can I, um, can I take advantage of autodiff to get the gradient of that thing? Yes. Um, that's through this function, it's just tf.gradient. Let me show you an example of this that I do have though. Um, so, oh, I'm right here. So here I'm extending uh, very short prints with the reparentization gradient using importance weighted uh, uh, updates. So this is just the Berta et al. with Roger Gross's extension. Uh, and it's a very simple extension. All you do is you change the loss function to incorporate an open importance weights. So how do we do that? So what I'm doing is I'm inheriting from this met, this class called MFVI. MFVI is the one that holds the reprim, uh, reprimandization gradients. Uh, I am, uh, up, I'm changing how we initialize the algorithm. I'm just incorporating one more argument. It's K, the number of important samples. Uh, now there's two different ways of building the loss function. I am slightly generalizing reprimandization the uh, importance weighted autoencoder to do both score function and uh, reprimandization gradients. So I am just creating this function called build loss. It does two different forms of loss functions. Let's focus on uh, the reprimandization loss. Um, so what does reprimandization loss look like? Um, combine this thing. It's uh, a set of k different expectations. There's qz1 to qzk. Uh, and now you're going to do the log 1 over k, sum k equals 1 to k, uh, p of x dk to qzk. Is that clear? This is all where we're implementing that loss function. Uh, and we're going to uh, empirically calculate this expectation using Monte Carlo samples. Okay, yeah, so related to this, then yeah. I guess the question is, inside the MCMC sampler, when you ask it for the log, for the conditional log prime, is it, the condition, is it, is it basically doing the uh, expected complete data log likelihood for the stuff that you don't have? It's, it works on, it works on samples. So it, it does it like, um, so like that there's other link variables that I'm not sampling right now, but I had VI estimates for, say. So imagine that I have a, I mean, it's just like, so imagine I had a big model with yep. uh, with some stuff that I'm gonna use VI for, and then I'm gonna do MCMC for some other things. And now when I'm in my MCMC sampler and I access this log prop, if that, if that's estimating, it's basically gonna do that the log prop like function handle that it gets those values are expected complete data log likelihoods integrating out the VI stuff? It depends. Um, because uh, if you defined X through just the model, you are working with data star where data star is a sample from the prior. Um, there is some graph copying that goes on where you can change going from data and X in the model to something like Q theta and X equals copy say qx copy well, x data. Well, like totally concretely, like let's imagine I wanted to use MCMC on the, on the, um, the like, uh, uh, the parameters of the mixture model. Okay. And then I want to use VI to integrate out the, uh, the assignments. Right, let's imagine. Right? Sure. Let's imagine that wasn't easy. And, uh, and the, or that I used, you know, so it's kind of like EM, but instead of the M setup, I'm gonna do MCMC. Then you know when we do the M set normally we would have like a complete data log likelihood, right? Mm -hmm. um, and now we we would have the we would have that for MCMC instead. So. Oh, I see what you're saying. I, was, I thought you were talking about like expectation of log likelihood. So complete data log likelihood you definitely have access to because yeah, the expected complete data log likelihood, right? Right. So the um, complete Which, like, data log likelihood would be normally right. The right. complete data log likelihood depends mm -hmm. on. Um, well, we don't know what those values. I mean, we can't. Yeah. Right. So 
you have to work on the Monte Carlo version of it. How do you work on the Monte Carlo version of it? You define, uh, let's do this. Okay, so even if it was like, even if they were like Gaussian approximations, you form Monte Carlo estimates of that expected complete data. If you can analytically uh, marginalize it out, then uh, you would um, you would define that particular collapse node in that infantile window. Like you would just say that okay. yeah. if you told it to do that, X is like a mixture, random variable. It's a specific node that is just the mixture, okay. and so on. Um, in this example. Um, this right here is just forming that uh, importance weighted thing where I have to do the log mean exp in order to make it numerically stable and so on. But um, that's what, what's um, sort of nice about the extensions of uh, and this class inheritance is that all you need to do is write down this loss function. Anyways. I have a quick question about the um, uh, EM math part. Just, yeah. uh, just curious, does it, is it sort of by default an iterative? Math, or is it smart enough to, to sort of look at the underlying distributions and say, oh, I know how to maximize these things analytically? Um, we, for math, we specifically just do add up on okay. the joint density. Yeah. So before you were saying that you could handle continuous, I mean, sorry, that you, you weren't limited to continuous variables. Yep. So what it sounds like you're saying is that you're you can use discrete variables, but you have to, but you have you to have hold, to have you have to hold their hand, right? You have to do the work to turn it into a like, for example, a like continuous math problem. The algorithms aren't uh, limited to continuous or discrete. It's it's just how we implement those algorithms as default. You can implement the uh, inference algorithms that do handle. You can implement a math right. that handles the discrete. So you're allowed to introduce discrete. Yeah, you're allowed you have to. to we just don't have the built-in thing for okay. discrete because okay. there's not a good, a good default. For it. And and something like Stan does not allow you to do that. At all. No. So what Stan does is that it very specifically defines the log density. I see. And there's no other structure. It doesn't know the difference between a prior and a likelihood. Yeah. So you have to you have to class everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's it. So I have. So for the summary. Uh, we've leveraged Box's loop as a design principle by Edward. Um, we've developed this language on computational graphs where the structure is exposed to the user. Um, and we've tried to develop this language around inference. It's very much a work in progress, by the way, if you haven't noticed. Uh, and it includes both model specific and generic algorithms. And we just said there's the link. Thanks.